I've got to tell you, I am really nervous. <laughs> I've never done this before, and certainly never done it in front of such a large and distinguished uh, audience. So if you'll just bear with me, in hopes of quieting my nerves, I've really got to tell you how this really went down between Robin and I. About eight months ago, I'm walking by the med center and Robin says, hey, I've got a great idea. We're, gonna, we're doing the Summer Institute and I'd really like you to be involved. And you know, being an immigrant child and being very insecure as a child, I have just an incredible need to please people. I mean, you know, somebody says walk on coals how long or jump off the uh, uh, Golden Gate Bridge how many times. So, Robin, great idea. W what, what do you want me to talk about? Oh, don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll really figure something out. And so I'd run into Robin and periodically I'd say, you know, the Institute's going to be in four months and three months. Have, have you decided what you want me to say? So Robin finally, a few months ago, says, Lou, I've got this great idea. This year we really want to emphasize what is new and exciting and breakthrough in terms of aut autism research. And we really want to emphasize, you know, the young researchers and scientists. So I kind of look at her and I say, yeah. And she says, well, let, let me tell you a little story. Do you remember Clint Eastwood? Yeah, one of my favorite actors. When you think of Clint Eastwood, what is the movie that immediately comes to mind? Well, it's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, this year we thought that our keynote speak would be the young, the old, and the stale. <laughs> so uh, here I am, folks, and uh, I, I hope that I can, um, you know, and, and the other thing Robin says, you know, you've really been around ever since the Earth's crust began to cool. So that if you really emphasize how things were in the old days, then the rest of the uh, Mind Institute will really understand and the folks will really understand the tremendous advances we've made over the past eons. So, Robin, thank you so much for this pleasure and privilege, I think. Um, the goals and objectives that Lori and I will try to uh, share with you today are our personal perspectives as well as some of the, of the policy and systems changes that are related to uh, changes faced by families, California's public policy related to autism uh, spectrum disorders, and then Lori will really get you excited about advances in research. Uh, this basically is just a brief summary of, of, my, uh, of my life. God, I, I, I mean, it, when, I, when I do this slide, I think about how many people were even born before I went to medical school. And, we, we won't ask for a show of hands. Um, this is a slide of, uh, taken of a picture of our son, Mark, uh, who was born in 1993. This was taken when he was four and a half, five years of age. And um, what always reminds me about this slide is, first of all, the number of interventions of a variety of, of uh, from a variety of perspectives that our family faced during those, uh, those years. Um, and we, we really kind of were overwhelmed by the whole situation. And the challenging aspect, as you all know about autism, is the multiplicity of factors, the pervasiveness of this disorder, the variability. And for our family, it was certainly uh, the uncertainty and the emotional challenges uh, were also pretty, uh, pretty overwhelming. I, one of the images that uh, really sticks in my mind was the, the severe behaviors that Mark experienced when, when he was like one and a half to three years of age. And at that time I was, I was very involved in my, in my private practice in, at Mercy General Hospital and had a large number of patients and people that I knew from the community. And often, I think, as, a, as parents, we really view our children and our families as a reflection of who and what we are and a sense of our own identity. And I can really remember walking uh, through Safeway grocery store here and Mark having a tantrum or having behaviors and really being embarrassed because I would see a neighbor or, or, or a patient. And it was just always such a feeling, you know, you know God, what am, I, what am I doing wrong? What, what have I done? What could I do better? What haven't we tried? So it's also this sense of, um, of, of, uh, 
of anger, frustration, anxiety. The, the worst experience in the emotion that I uh, ex uh, felt uh, going through this very trying period was, uh, was a sense of uncertainty. Having worked in medicine essentially all of my adult life, uh, and particularly in cardiology where we have cutting edge tools, where we have ways of evaluating individuals, where there are ways of finding out what the problem is and addressing it, uh, dealing with a child with autism back in the 90s was a completely very foreign and daunting and overwhelming experience. Um, the, the other aspect that was very difficult for me to, to overcome was a tremendous sense of loss. Uh, for the first year, year and a half, we really thought that Mark was the prototypical ideal child. Uh, he met all of his developmental mi milestones during the first year. He was bright. He seemed, you know, happy, active, interacted. And, and then uh, during his second year, we noticed that, you know, his babbling ceased, his speech did not come in, and uh, uh, when he was about 16 to 17 months, uh, we were fortunate to have him, you know, to have him diagnosed and to start early intervention therapy, which did help, did make a significant difference, but certainly uh, left a lot of daunting challenges. Um, with a background in medicine and with having privileges to have access to a number of, of individuals in the community and, 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 and elsewhere, um, I dealt personally with a lot of my frustrations, anxieties, fear, guilts, and the emotions shown on the previous slide by really turning to what I knew best, and that was medicine and science. And so um, in the late, in the mid-1990s, um, a group of, a small group of families uh, met and uh, truly through a team effort and with a tremendous amount of community support and with an incredible commitment from the, uh, uh, the folks at the UC Davis Health Center System and the, and, and the medical school. And Robin, Dr. Hansen, was, was right there at the beginning along with uh, a number of other individuals. We were able to, um, to initiate the starting of, of, of the MIND Institute. And since advocacy is such an important aspect of, of this year's Mind Institute, throughout my presentation, I will try to share with you some of the mistakes that we've made, but also some of the strategies and some of the approaches that seem to have been effective or worked in this situation with the hope that, that people here in the audience and attending the Institute will, will take them to a whole complete level. Although a lot's been accomplished in the past decade, again, through a tremendous commitment and involvement for an incredible array of, of individuals, there is a tremendous amount that ne needs to be done. And with the economic challenges that our state and our nation and individuals are facing, uh, this is a, an incredibly important task, which requires a commitment and the involvement of everyone in this room and even those beyond. One of the important aspects that led to the success of the Mind Institute was really the idea of a public-private partnership. Again, uh, there was a small group of families, but there were a lot of people involved in this effort. And again, through incredibly generous donations, we were able to raise a, a significant amount of, of money uh, during the first few months that this vision was entertained. This money was actually leveraged uh, through um, uh, additional private donations from commitments from the University of California and the UCD Health Center System, Health Sciences System, and also from uh, legislative appropriations. And, and the way we were successful with the legislature was, first of all, having personal relationships with key legislative advocates from both parties. Governor Wilson was, uh, was in, in, in office at the time and was very, very supportive. Um, and again, I shown to the right of the slide were some of the uh, uh, approaches that we used, including uh, clearly defining that the autism epidemic was a serious public health issue, 
that the Mind Institute would be unique and, and our vision was for a, a truly world-class institution, that it would provide answers and uh, ultimately would result in economic savings to the state. And again, with incredible gratitude for ongoing community support and through the leadership of, uh, again, uh, Dr. Hansen and an incredible number of, of individuals uh, in the health sciences system and in the medical school, I believe that our, our hope, many of our hopes and prayers and, and, and views for the Mind Institute uh, have come, are coming, and must come in the future to pass. And again, your participation, your involvement, your, your engagement is, will, is and will really be crucial to our effort. This, is, this truly has to be an ongoing team approach. And again, the fact that you're here this morning and participating is something for which I don't have the words to adequately express my admiration and my appreciation for your involvement. So thank you all very, very much for being here. Um, the mission of the Mind Institute is again noted and all of these slides are in your package so I do not want to, to belabor them. Uh, the current status of the Mind Institute is again summarized briefly in this slide. Um, the research and the science and the knowledge base that is currently going on at the mind is truly, truly awesome and I hope that you will uh, share that appreciation after the end of, uh, of, of, of this important summit. Um, I'm very excited and privileged to be the incoming chair of the Mind Advisory Board. Uh, I have worked with key members of our board and during my tenure we have outlined three specific goals and objectives. Number one is to take the science and the research and scientific advances that are at the mind and find in innovative approaches of bringing them out into the community and finding greater ways and finding improved and innovative ways to provide greater uh, access and, and finding ways to, uh, to find bridges into the community. There's no doubt that the mind is focused on science and research, but with the innovations that are occurring, which is, are certainly in the areas of technology, telehealth, and telemedicine, which is my second focus, which will be our second focus, I'm truly hopeful that these adv scientific advances can be brought to bear into the community. And then the third is ongoing efforts to reach out and to establish ties in the community, particularly to underserved uh, areas. And so any and all of you who are, have interest in participating in this effort, I hope that you will use this summit to learn more about the Mind Institute, to be involved and to be engaged. So let me make a pitch for everyone here to visit the Mind Institute. Uh, Terry Contenti, uh, who is the uh, Mind Community Outreach Director, is, will be available. Uh, I, I believe there is a, there's literature and information and we really, really need your participation. The, the last bullet point on this slide is perhaps the most important, and that is that the state funding of the Mind Institute it's, is being completed, which means that we need to augment the incredible grants and scientific research with uh, additional uh, fundraising efforts in the community in, in, and through foundations. So please, invite, involve, and invest. Do this not only with those here, but also reach out to, uh, to your friends, neighbors, and, uh, and, and contacts. Part of the other recurring theme that I've learned and would like to share with you um, during this talk is that while so much of the focus is on autism, Many of the lessons, many of the approaches, many of the science and breakthroughs that are being made in autism can help a wide array of other individuals. Autism is the proverbial canary in the mine shaft. So many of these, uh, of, of these uh, findings and breakthroughs can help a wide array of individuals. Um, the next part of my talk would 
is basically a brief overview of, of some of the uh, activities that I've been involved with at the state level. Um, Robin mentioned that I was uh, involved in the, in the, as a founding member of the Prop 10 initiative. This was the first tobacco tax that Rob Reiner championed back in 1998, before there was this whole spate of, of initiatives placed on the ballot. He came up with a very bright idea that a tobacco tax could be used to enhance early child development. Uh, this initiative raised uh, between 800 and 900 million dollars uh, annually, and since it was passed in 1998, I believe it's it's raised somewhere around seven to eight billion dollars. Uh, it, it was really an incredible experience serving in that commission because, quite frankly and honestly, up until that time, I had been strictly you know an 80-hour-a-week interventional cardiologist, and I knew. Neck, I knew nothing really about state government, state policy. You know, I knew something about advocacy because I'd get patients to take the medications and, and that was about the extent of it. But it really seemed that the state Prop 10 had money, that it was a wonderful opportunity and again through personal connections. I happened to meet Senator John Burton through our work with the Mind Institute. He got to appoint two people to this eight member commission. So I knocked on Senator Burton's door and I said, hi, I'm Lou Bismarck, would you appoint me to the Prop 10 Commission? And so we had a little talk and his dad was a doctor and we had mutual friends. And the next thing I knew, everybody was trying to figure out what a cardiologist was doing on the state Prop 10 Commission. So a lot of times you just have to, you know, take a deep breath, identify your vision, what you want to accomplish and just jump in. And, and sometimes you have to learn on the job. And it was just an incredible experience. Uh, I learned a tremendous amount about public policy, made a lot of mistakes. I remember Rob Reiner as we were, as we were uh, evolving the policies and, and the guidelines for this commission, he would always say that this is like trying to build an airplane while you're flying it. And, and that was certainly, I thought, a very, very good analogy. But it was a, a wonderful experience and, and the state commission is still, is still functioning. There are 58 local county commissions that are doing a tremendous amount uh, in early child development. Um, the, uh, as a result of my work on the Prop 10 Commission in relationship with uh, Senator Burton, I actually had taken a year sabbatical uh, to come and work here at, at the University of California, not, not here, but at, at the UC, uh, when the Mind Institute was starting. And after that year sabbatical, the idea of going back to full-time cardiology practice uh, with the issues we were facing with our own child seemed pretty overwhelming. So at that time, I basically bid my 16 partners in our cardiovascular group practice a fond farewell. And over the past 12 years, I've been privileged to work as a full-time consultant at the state capitol. And it's really been a neat experience. I mean, first of all, um, I get to work with very bright young people, which is just, uh, just an, a, a privilege. I would guess that the average age of, of the staff person working in the Capitol, and particularly with the onset of term limits, is, are probably individuals in, uh, in their early to mid-30s. Anna Montesanos, who was Governor Schwarzenegger and now is Jerry Brown's budget director. So she's responsible for California's general fund budget, which is like now $83 billion. Anna is 34 years of age, incredibly bright, very dedicated, you know, I think literally lives at the Capitol. But this is the type of, of talent and this is the type of energy that exists down there. And to be an old geezer and to be able to, to learn from, uh, from these young, uh, bright individuals has been, has been truly, uh, truly uh, a privilege. So back in 2005, when, when I was working for um, Senator Don Parada, who was a pro tem at that time, we came up with the idea of having a Blue Ribbon Commission. And what was kind of interesting and innovative about that approach was that in addition, there were 16 members of this commission, and in addition to having about half of the individuals who were, quote, autism folks, we thought it would be interesting to bring in kind of like people who were from business, who were from education, who were from health sciences, and from other areas that were relevant and important to the efforts that we're trying to do, but really weren't autism folks. 
All too often I've found that we as advocates are very passionate and what we basically wind up doing is having the proverbial priest talking to the proverbial choir. So if we're always talking among ourselves, we may really get engaged with our message and we may get really fired up, but where's that message going? It's staying in the room. So the idea of having, quote, complete strangers uh, come and participate, we thought was, was, uh, was an interesting approach. And it really did turn out to be the right approach because as a result of that, we were able to get our message out into, into different venues. And we were also able to uh, view our issues and our problems from a different perspective. I mean, we always say that one in 110 individuals or children now is affected or impacted by autism. But if you think about it, that means that 109 children are not and their families are not. So somehow we need to look at it through both lenses. We need to look at it through the lens of this increasing epidemic, but we also need to look at it from the perspective of what can we do to make this relevant, to make this involve, uh, to involve and to make this important to the 109 families who perhaps are not directly impacted by autism. So I think it's really looking at it through, through uh, trying to look at it from the perspective of, of both sides. One of the other lessons that I've learned and I'd like to share with you is the importance of when we, there's a problem and one has a vision that it is important to also have a focus. And again, the focus of uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission was again to specifically try to identify and to rectify, to close. The only reason to identify a problem, in my opinion, is to try to solve it. So what we did is we identified target goals of early identification and intervention, the education, the continuous treatment, and also this problem of the this, this tsunami that we're all facing with this huge population of kids who are you know, in their teenage years and will soon be aging out. Our son now, Mark, has just turned 18 years of age. I mean, it seems like yesterday that he was seeing Robin uh, as, as, a, as, as, a, as a toddler. So uh, time passes very, very quickly. Uh, so basically, uh, the commission had three task forces. It had town hall meetings. And importantly, it did have a specific report to the governor and to the legislature. Now, in organizing the commission, again, uh, what mentors provided and what we implemented were the following factors and considerations that it's critically important to involve the consumers, parents, and actually the people working in the field. There has to be, we have to overcome this, this disconnect between the policy maker and the, and the providers and the people that are affected. Somehow, when we start these projects, it has to be a collaborative approach. But as a state entity, we wanted to tackle problems in which the state had a clear role and responsibility and also in which solutions could be clearly identified. And one of the frustrations that I have with reports at all levels is that they can be tremendously inclusive, they can be very informative, they can be incredibly visionary. But at the end of the day, when you get to the report, the question I always ask myself after I garner this information is, can they be implemented? And it doesn't matter whether it's at the short or the long term, but ultimately, in my view, when you're doing something and when you're acquiring information, how can you put that information to the best possible use? And part of that uh, potential use is having an impact on families and individuals, but also part of that is trying to impact systems changes. So here is a, a summary of the report that we submitted to the governor and the legislature in 2007. Uh, this information is available on the internet and can be uh, accessed either by Googling California Blue Ribbon Commission or through the website uh, uh, identification that's also indicated in your in your site uh, in your in your package um, again we feel that when you have a vision when you take up people's time when you ask them to get involved with it it's important that people have a return on their investment and 
in our currency, legislation, actions, and outcomes are an important currency for these investments. And so therefore, um, if people are kind enough and committed enough, we want to show them results. In 2008, we did have a uh, legislative package. The first bill that was signed into law provided uh, housing for individuals moving out of the Agnews Developmental Center in the Bay Area. Uh, the second bill is uh, led to an excellent video that has been created and is established for law enforcement. It's a three-hour video that helps law enforcement, police officers, first responders understand, evaluate, and deal appropriately with uh, individuals with autism that they meet in, in the community and they encounter in the community. This could be a potentially horrific problem and tragically has been in some situations. This video, which is also available on our website, goes a long ways to at least alerting these individuals that, you know, the kid running down the street or failing to respond or, you know, bashing his head against the wall or not putting his hands or following instructions, that he may be, uh, a part of his inappropriate actions may be related to autism. And the, uh, the other t final two bills um, were specifically focused to providing and identifying more qualified teachers who could participate in the education of students with autism. Uh, there were four other bills that were passed but not signed into law by our previous governor. Again, they related to early identification and collaboration uh, between school districts and regional centers and uh, also uh, SB 1563, which is probably my favorite subject, is the ongoing issue of being sure that private health plans step up to the plate and do their fair share in providing appropriate behavioral intervention therapy. And as I'll share with you in a few minutes, that's an ongoing battle that I'm very, very excited about. So uh, with the uh, positive results and as a result of the work of the Blue Ribbon Commission, we were able to actually engage a significant number of legislators, members of the California Senate. And uh, a few of these folks suggested, you know, is there something that we can do as a group and, and individually to keep tackling? We're really interested in these issues. We really see the potential for, again, not only dealing with autism, but also helping our, our, our districts and our communities and, the, and our constituents in terms of early child development, in terms of neurodevelopmental disorders, et cetera. So as a result of, of, this, uh, of this interest, um, uh, a couple of years ago, we started the Senate Select Committee on Autism-Related Disorders. Now, what I neglected to mention was that the chair of the Blue Ribbon Commission was an individual who was an attorney in private practice. He had been termed out of the legislator and could, legislation and could not run for two years. And that attorney was Daryl Steinberg, who chaired the Blue Ribbon Commission, and Daryl has been a key force, as, as many of you know, not only in developmental disorders, but was also the guiding force with the mental health uh, uh, parity, not the mental health parity bill, and also the, uh, the mental health uh, uh, tax, which has been instrumental in providing services to, indivi uh, to individuals across the state with mental health disorders. So Daryl agreed to be the chair for the Senate Select Committee on Autism and Related Disorders. And again, the goals and objectives of this committee were to continue this, uh, pri this <clears throat> collaborative effort between the Senate and the uh, local districts, and also to continue with much of the work of the Blue Ribbon Commission. Um, again, the areas that were identified for focus inclu included early identification, the insurance coverage, transitional education, training, and employment. And a new issue was also put on the agenda, and that is the importance of providing accessible and affordable housing. Uh, there were 12 statewide task forces and working groups were established. These are continuing at the present time. Again, my contact information is included in your uh, syllabus and I would be privileged, delighted, and happy to communicate with any of you 
hopefully not at the, not all at the same time, but uh, please feel free. Email is my favorite form of, of communication, but I would love to, uh, uh, to continue or to, uh, and, and if any of you are interested in, in getting involved in any of these task force or work groups, again, please, uh, please shoot me an email or give me a call. Um, here are the task forces. We're also in the process of organizing one in Sonoma, so we will have 13 or 14 task forces. This year we have 20 senators. That's half of the California State Senate uh, has signed up for the Senate Select Committee. It's members of both parties. Um, in closing, let me uh, share with you uh, just a, a little bit of, of information about my favorite topic from a legislative perspective, and that's the issue of private health insurance coverage. Um, you know, since, since Lovas published one of the seminal papers in the late 80s uh, about uh, the importance of behavioral intervention therapy as a treatment and intervention an important uh, uh, aspect for um, uh, autism spectrum disorders, there has been increasing evidence that at this point in time, while it's not exclusively, it certainly is a very promising, if not the most promising form of therapy for many, many individuals with, with autism. Uh, do I believe that it can cure uh, children, perhaps in some, um, from a personal experience, uh, behavioral therapy was crucial to Mark's life, gave him speech where he had none. Uh, it's also been interesting to experience firsthand the wide array of behavioral intervention therapy, everything from discrete trial training to pivotal response therapy, which worked probably very effective to the early start Denver model combined with uh, a, a whole array of pharmacological interventions and medical supports. So, you know, unfortunately, there is no magic bullet. And again, as we have learned over the past several years, autism is truly a spectrum and has a wide array of probable, of, uh, undoubtedly has a wide array of causes. And now the researchers are telling us that there's probably a wide array of underlying actual diseases or, or situations. So it's unrealistic. It's been an interesting experience, and again, I think Robin can recall that we've had this conversation about insurance coverage, what, 10 or 12 years? And, you know, um, when we first approached the health plans, and we did this on several occasions, initially 10, 11 years ago, the health plans would say, why should we pay for this? It doesn't work. And then as the evidence you know, prove them wrong on that issue. Well, it might work for a few kids, but you know, we really can't fund this because it's experimental. Well, you know, again, the data has been accumulating showing that, that you know, that uh, for some kids it's, li it's life-saving. It's been interesting that now in the past couple of years when the independent medical reviews, in other words, when, when a uh, uh, medically necessary service is, is, is refused by the health plans, uh, the oversight organizations, either Department of Insurance or DMHC, they send it to independent medical review. And in, um, uh, recently, they have determined that in 90% of the cases that it is medically necessary. So in the past couple of years, the health plans, who have excellent attorneys, have said it's not a covered benefit because it is educational. So therefore, they don't have to send it to independent medical review and they feel they don't have to pay for it. Many of the health plans, what they basically do, their idea of providing treatment is telling the families, go see a regional center. This is, should be provided by your school district. You know, that's not something we have to do. Anyway. Many of the legislators, including my boss, Senator Steinberg, feel this has not been acceptable. We've had hearings over the years. We actually had a hearing that Robin um, and other mind researchers participated in June of last year, of June of 2010, and we had a follow-up hearing just uh, a couple of weeks ago in July 13th, and the upshot is that there is an excellent chance that Senator Steinberg will introduce legislation 
that basically will enforce and provide clarity to the existing mental health parity, which says that health plans shall provide coverage for the diagnosis and medically necessary treatment of uh, severe mental illness, which shall include autism or pervasive developmental disorders. So stay tuned. If that indeed legislation is introduced, we will need a lot of community support, advocacy, and involvement. Basically, the changing landscape of autism, public policy and advocacy, the California economy, again, speaks for itself. We're going to really, really need to watch this carefully. Our budget now is back to the level that it was about 20 years ago. General fund spending from California is back to a level seen in 1981, 1982. Uh, it's not going to be pretty for the next couple of years. It's going to have direct impact on the services and the systems that so many of you in this audience are dealing with. Um, here's kind of what I've learned over the past 12 years about some concepts of public policy and trying to get it done. Know your subject, focus in brevity, frame the issue and make it relevant, offer a tangible solution, first meeting is never the end, pick your battles, know your opposition, form alliances, and perhaps the most important aspect is relationships, relationships, and relationships. Here are the top 10 things they didn't teach me in medical school. Number 10, having a child with a disability or special needs is really tough. Number nine, having a child with a disability strains all relationships. The incidence of divorce among families dealing with a child with autism is, is 86%. Uh, thank God that our family has, has survived. Uh, uh, I think it's, a, it's an indication of my obsessive nature, but it, it's <laughs> not been easy. Uh, they didn't teach us how to care for a disabled child while spending the entire day either filling out forms and or being placed on hold. We, we still experience that. Didn't tell us how to keep your child with autism from killing the cat, smashing furniture, and or putting his head through the plate glass window while you're on hold and filling out forms. <laughs> they didn't uh, tell us how to maintain your sanity when after finishing the correct forms and speaking to a real life person, you're informed that there's a waiting list of six months for the program's enrollment. They didn't tell us to know whether your child is not being enrolled in the program because of eligibility or because of functional assessments. I still don't know exactly what that means, but. They didn't tell us how to deal with systems that appear to be not knowledgeable, not listening, or not caring. They didn't tell us how to get information transferred from one program to another. They didn't tell us that systems responsive to autism will better serve a wide array of developmental and learning disabilities. and. Um, that despite the challenges and problems associated with these systems, there's just an incredible number of dedicated and loving people. And, and these people, uh, I still get choked up about thinking all the people that have made such an incredible uh, and supportive impact on our lives over the past 16 years. And uh, in closing, dignity, hope, opportunity, and love are the birthrights of all individuals. We all need a job, a home, and a friend. And in closing, never doubt that a small group of committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you so much. He got me a little choked up there. Excuse me. <laughs> so, well, first of all, this is quite an honor to be here. I've actually never spoken at the Summer Institute yet, so to be invited to give the keynote uh, feels truly special. And kind of like my dad, Robin Hansen <laughs> approached me casually in the hall of the Mind Institute as I was leaving one meeting and going to another and just said, hey, would you ever want to give a talk with your dad? I think it'd be really fun and you know, you could share some personal stories. And, and I thought she was talking about you know, going to like a Mind boardroom or something or the cozy auditorium and then turns out I, I get to give a keynote. So. So thank you very much to, to Robin Hansen and to the committee here uh, for putting together such an innovative and, and informative um, agenda. Uh, so like my dad, I'm also a little nervous. Um, I am relieved, though, that there were no embarrassing pictures of me in his PowerPoints or stories shared. So, um, but like him, this is a very, obviously, personal and, um, sorry, an emotional journey that has 
impacted me um, tremendously in my career. I, I'm just curious in the, in the audience how many members here are parents or, or um, family members to a um, child or individual with autism. Okay. And out of that group, how many are in the field somehow um, in autism? So there's a lot. So this, um, this, that dual relationship has um, led me into the career of autism, um, starting in college when I uh, began volunteering uh, at a, in a research laboratory in, in San Diego, um, trying to understand the merging between the brain and behavior relationships and how that um, affects um, young children with autism. And from my interactions there, in addition to um, obviously my relationship with my family and my brother, it really pushed me to want to get into um, a clinical career. I, I wasn't so focused on research at the time, I just thought that um, autism is very mysterious, it's, um, there's so much unknown about it, and I, I wanted to understand more to, to contribute back to society, but also to um, try to give back to my family. Sorry. So, so that led me into uh, a career in, in early intervention. Um, and I had the good fortune of being accepted at UC Santa Barbara and studying with the Kegels, uh, learning about pivotal response to treatment. And then in 2005, when I was faced with having to leave school and not sure what really to, what direction to go into, um, I had again the good fortune of meeting Dr. Sally Rogers, who is a professor here at the um, Mind Institute and a developmental psychologist. And uh, I was accepted into a, um, a postdoctoral program at the Mind Institute and was able to learn so much from her about family relationships beyond my own in terms of how to really listen to parents' needs, their priorities, their frustrations, and their visions, and how to do something about that through research. So that's the goal. My goal today is to share with you um, research advances focused primarily from parents' advocacy, from their, um, their push, their, their uh, perseverance, and uh, to share with you kind of these latest trends emerging in research. And I just want to also dedicate this talk to my brother, Mark, and to the other children and individuals with autism who, despite daily life challenges, meet that with dignity and grace and courage. So thank you again for letting me be here to talk about this. Okay, so uh, what I found interesting was that an online survey released by Autism Speaks um, just uh, in April of this year, which Autism Speaks, for those of you who don't, don't know, is an autism science and advocacy organization. It surveyed families about the uh, top 10 places to live, best 10 places to live if you have autism. And the criteria included uh, parent satisfaction of the availability of autism-specific services and resources, the proximity of these service, services to where families lived, flexible, flexible employer policies, and access to medical care and recreational op opportunities. And nearly 75% of respondents were not satisfied with their community resources and services for autism across the United States. And so this really, you know, what they, what they shared um, very vehemently about were the enormous amount of barriers to accessing timely and comprehensive services um, for reasons such as um, treatment services being extremely costly and expensive, which I think is what's so uh, timely right now about uh, my father speaking about this um, health, health insurance bill and the time for health insurance companies to step up to the plate. They can't avoid this. It's their uh, duty to pay for this. Families should not have to um, pay so much out of pocket, which can be up to $50,000 per year. Um, families also shared having to travel considerable distances for treatment, sometimes up to an hour or more. Uh, and then the demands of having to serve as their child's kind of case coordinator to navigate through all the different um, um, phone numbers and, and resource centers out there, to stay on hold, to fill out the paperwork, to put all, it all together so that their child can have, again, um, comprehensive, immediate care. And this can force parents to reduce or stop working, um, especially, again, if they're faced with less flexible work policies. There's also extreme difficulty finding specialized experts 
to help their children learn and uh, address all of their uh, behavioral and developmental needs, especially when it comes to medical care. Parents of children with autism, unlike parents of children with, children with other developmental disabilities, have twice as much difficulty trying to access medical um, expert care. So again, the challenges are enormous and it results in inconsistent quality sometimes being delivered to, um, to children or to individuals. And you know, I think part of the problem is that there's so much information out there as to what might be an appropriate um, uh, treatment approach or service that it makes the whole process very unreliable, inaccurate, and overwhelming to families. And as a result, then, again, what I, my aim to share with you today is how research has responded then to the different challenges and responsibilities and roles that parents face. Uh, and so four areas I'm going to be talking about is how it's uh, directed from research, again, based on um, parents' priorities, is laying out an evidence-based approach to treatment in which we're following a recommended set of, um, of practices based on scientific support, on real scientific support, to confirm authentic change in children's outcomes as a result of testing these active ingredients. Uh, another um, uh, advance, advancement is starting intervention earlier. So trying to identify at-risk behaviors in infants uh, and from that point of, of screening or first concerns, providing intervention and, and services right then and there. Parents have always been involved in their children's lives. They're their um, child's most natural teacher. And not that we want to burden them with more expectations or responsibilities, but teaching them a, um, direct strategies to help get them involved with the delivery and to inform and educate then you know, team members, educational providers, um, that are going to come into and out of their, their children's lives just as they naturally grow and develop. And then lastly, like my dad, I'm particularly excited about technology, the advances in technology, to mobilize services to families uh, so that we can make them more accessible, more affordable, uh, but still customized so that we're not compromising the quality of care provided to children. So I just wanted to kind of present here kind of this, this comparison where um, there is a different approach when we're um, addressing kind of medical needs versus um, how, we're, how we're responding um, in, in, in treatment options for children with autism spectrum disorder. In that, in the medical field, there's a programmatic or decision tree approach, you know, this very systematic attitude about how to respond or uh, address and, and uh, treat specific health-related problems. So for example, if a patient came to my father and you know, complained of chest pains and there were, um, or he noted obstructed, I hope I'm getting this right, Dad, obstructed blood vessels, then the recommended, okay, the recommended treatment approach would be angioplasty, which I found out is widening that narrowed or obstructed blood vessel. That's right, okay. So that would be the course of action to take. There wouldn't be a lot of debate or discussion about that. Um, similarly, if someone is diabetic, insulin is provided, or if you're suffering from pneumonia, you're given penicillin. So it's very defined um, and, 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 uh, and laid out. Whereas in, aut in autism spectrum disorders or, or autism, families aren't turning to professionals necessarily. They're going on to the internet and they're searching themselves. And I understand why, you know, you, you, your life has changed. Um, you're trying to make sense of it. You're, many families or, or parents um, are wanting to respond with action, and so the internet makes it, you know, very easy to go online and to do the search um, and, and you know, yourself to educate yourself. But it can be problematic in that it's not always, again, providing accurate, consistent, and reliable information. Um, and in fact, uh, with recent research that examines kind of the number of well, it, it's been examining what parents are, are, are wanting to use and in terms of the, um, the package of intervention services that they um, secure for their children. And it's found that on average, uh, parents will have up to seven different treatments happening at the same time to, um, to treat their child, which can be interesting and potentially problematic if the treatment approaches are, are using different um, strategies to help their children learn. They can oftentimes conflict with one another and the child's kind of left feeling unsure 
um, are unfamiliar with what exactly is expected of him or her. So parents are using up to seven different treatment approaches. However, the range in a survey um, of, of families, it was over 600 families, was that some were using up to 20 different approaches. They're really trying to just pull whatever they can. And that's, that, you know, that's just such an awful place to be, to be not sure what to do, what to use, where to go, who to talk to. And it's what makes our job, is, or my job as a researcher, even more important to try to share and disseminate um, evidence-based practices to families, um, which is the way that we can define that decision-making pro process to treatment selection. So this does exist. There are recommended set of approaches that have, that have been studied extensively with many children um, and um, adults with autism uh, who represent different skill abilities, learning styles, uh, and severity of symptoms. And in spite of this variability that is so common to autism, these set of approaches are emerging as the most um, um, appropriate. They're, um, the, they're tested to be proven and effective, so they're defensible in that way. They're accountable in that they're likely to change behavior and improve outcomes. And they've been found to be the most efficient way to learn again with a defined consistent method to teaching skills and behaviors. And so in research then you know we're faced with this um, challenge again of how to bridge that gap between what we've developed, what we're testing in university settings, and then what's actually being implemented or put into practice uh, in community settings. And to help facilitate this information flow, there are many resources, credible, empirically supported resources, again, available um, to the community to help bridge that gap between what's um, happening in a university um, and, and community. And so one such resource is the Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, um, in which there, we have a, this project um, uh, currently uh, operating at the Mind Institute under the direction of Robin Hansen. And on this you know, website, there's online training materials. They're intended for people to click on and to start learning about the different, uh, different evidence-based practices are the ones that have, again, scientific um, confirmed support for um, direct positive change. It's on the right-hand side, direct positive change here in, in children and um, adults' behavior. So the ways to access this, again, is to go to reputable resources um, and sites like the Mind Institute, uh, like Autism Speaks, for example, that has online toolkits, again, explaining uh, what all of these different treat treatment approaches um, include, what they offer, how to access them. And more recently on Autism Speech, which is really exciting, is now a video glossary. So you can see actual videos of these, um, all these various treatment approaches and what they look like when delivered um, competently by professionals and by family members. There's also summary reports, again, of what's, uh, what constitutes um, a, a strong evidence-based practice as well as what uh, types of approaches are emerging as, um, as um, as helpful suggestions as well. So, so the information is out there, and we're, researchers have really listened again to parents' frustrations, and we're trying to um, close that, that gap. Another trend, as I mentioned earlier uh, in research, is understanding the onset of, of symptoms um, for infants at risk of autism and following them shortly after birth, following siblings that have an, or sorry, following infants that have an older sibling already diagnosed with autism, and following them at, at birth up through that, that possible window of autism up to three years of age. Um, this project is, again, ongoing at the Mind Institute. It's called the Infant Sibling Study, and it's led by Dr. Sally Ozanoff, a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. And as a result of that project where uh, Dr. Rosenoff and, and her team are um, tr closely monitoring um, these infants um, throughout their, their, their growth up to age three, when they are encountering a child showing an at-risk profile, these possible elevated symptoms suggesting autism, we now have a project called the Infant Start Project uh, led by uh, Dr. Sally Rogers where we can enroll these babies 
immediately into intervention and work with their parents who are who naturally at this age are spending the most time with their babies to deliver a set of intervention practices and see how this might change these babies course of development whether we can reduce um, possible symptoms such as this unusual um, uh, focus on more so on objects than to people or the way in which they're moving their bodies or playing with objects is very again repetitive um, one of uh, Dr. Ozanoff's um, recent research findings was that an at-risk behavior of possible autism but also just developmental, um, general developmental delay could be the way in which ch uh, babies manipulate the objects. So if they're constantly rotating or spinning or even just staring for prolonged periods of time at an object, that could be a red flag. So that on top of um, low or limited um, verbal production from babies, uh, not a lot of babbling, not a lot of consonant or vowel speech-like production, as well as, again, that kind of overall lack of social interest to what people are doing um, apart from the objects. And then not combining communicative behaviors like making sounds and looking and gesturing um, and, and directing that whole communicative package to people. Those are the behaviors that we're looking um, that we're screening in these babies. And when they're showing this package, we're, we've developed uh, this kind of infant version of the Early Start Denver model, which is a, an approach to working with toddler and preschool age children with autism. So we've extended these practices down into the infancy range so that we can help address and stimulate these behaviors and see whether we can get them onto um, a closer developmental trajectory to typical development. In this model, parents are coming um, to our center as well as we're going into their homes uh, for an hour and a half each week for 12 weeks and trying to support them in this very isolating, um, challenging time. So again, responding right away um, with actual practice to help families cope and to address uh, their needs. And I just want to show you a video, hopefully this works, um, of a one baby's uh, progress. So in this first video, you're going to see him in a high chair. There's mom. She's been told just to play with him to see what she can do to get him to look at her, but not necessarily to use her hands. So we can put a little bit more responsibility on the baby. So he's looking a lot at the toys. No eye contact to mom, no orienting. She's getting closer, making silly sounds, doing everything she can to get him to look up and, and acknowledge her. <clears throat> He's very quiet. He's a little irritable. Okay. So now, 12 weeks later, so this is abbreviated. Um, it's not meant to be the whole intervention package. It's meant to just be a more kind of first step or, or immediate service, again, to help stimulate growth, to help equip parents with uh, tools and information to get started right away. And hopefully, that it's our, another goal in this study is that it can be used practically by families. It doesn't require a lot of um, uh, separate you know, setup or kind of specialized instruction, but it's a set of naturalistic strategies that can be used in any opportunity that happens in parents and baby's life um, from you know being in the high chair because it's feeding time to playing on the floor to um, being on the on the changing table because we're going to change diapers but we can still interact and stimulate growth so it's really the intention is that we're using a set of um, accessible uh, appropriate practices that can help stimulate immediate change, useful change in, children, in these babies, so that once we get them onto this right trajectory, they can learn complex skills more easily, more readily, and, um, and again, close that gap 
that we know will happen uh, between children with autism and typically developing children if left untreated. That gap only widens and we don't want to do that. So now let me show you the video. It's the same setup. Um, little the baby's now 13 months old. He's in the high chair. He's playing with similar toy, and mom again is sitting on her hands and seeing how much she can, how many um, behaviors or various behaviors she can elicit from him during this interaction. So we see smiles, directed behavior. He still likes the keys, but he's sharing. Lots of eye contact, lots of recognition. Lots of social connection there. We're teaching in these naturalistic approach, approaches through relationships because it's how um, children typically learn. They watch what we do, they, what we do, they attend to what we do, they absorb what we do, and through that, those exchanges, they're learning, and if, and if they need help, we're scaffolding them to show them this is what you know, this object's called, or this is what this action means. And we want to, again, penetrate this autism barrier as early as we can. So we uh, have some initial data then from three children that um, started the project um, somewhere between seven to uh, ten and a half months of age. And we've been following them so far up through their 24-month um, or two-year-old birthday. And so on this scale, this is the Mullen scales of early learning. It's showing their developmental progress um, across uh, domains like expressive and receptive communication and uh, communication, uh, fine motor and um, visual um, perception skills. And the black line here is the norm. This is what typically developing children, um, their, um, their standardized responses um, across age. And so we see for child one, um, who started intervention um, based, again, by the start, 11 months of age, we're seeing that he's not only meeting the norm um, for, for what his, uh, where he should be age-wise, but he's exceeding that. He's, um, respond, I mean, he's responded in that very high, high range. And then for child four here in purple, um, again, we're seeing, well, we saw a little drop-off. I'll tell you a little bit more about child four. Um, for child, uh, another child 11, we're seeing we saw a drop, 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 but then it's coming back up. So parents, again, even though the 12 weeks have ended, parents have this set of strategies to continue using, to continue stimulating, to pass on to other family members, to other um, team support members, so that we can try to reverse um, the effects of autism. Now, the other results that we're tracking are how children, um, or their diagnostic outcomes uh, based off of the, the ADOS, the, uh, the gold standard for uh, diagnosing children with autism or autism spectrum disorder. And so what's interesting is that these children, again, at such young ages, they're showing these red flags. Later on, when they're in that appropriate range to, to have the ADOS done, they're still meeting some criteria. But then for two children at their most recent visit, so 18 months for one visit and 24 months uh, for the second child, they, um, they, didn't ha they didn't meet any autism or ASD criteria. All of their at-risk symptoms were no longer evident. They um, came out as typically developing children. So they were not showing this, this profile anymore related to autism. For that, uh, for child four here, the one in purple, whose scores drop a little bit, um, he has, he's very, he, when, he, when, when, uh, when he was diagnosed, he had very affected um, behaviors, very limited range of communication and, and interaction skills. He's also a sibling. Um, or has an older sibling, um, five years of age currently, who has autism. So there is that genetic um, load there. And so far what we've seen is that his initial diagnosis of autistic disorder, so the full, uh, full expression, has now at least lessened to ASD. So, and we'll continue to, to track him. We're actually extending this project so that we can um, see these children and uh, recently enrolled children back at 36 months of age so we can um, follow their profiles longer. 
So our goal is to, um, as I mentioned, to see how preventative these early treatments can be, how plastic is early autism. We certainly know the brain is malleable at this young age, so how much improvement can we, um, can we, can we cause? And also trying to figure out, again, the right approach to treatment, since we are dealing with such a young and vulnerable population, um, as well as how to best meet parents' needs in this time of stress, um, possible depression, and, um, and feelings of, of despair, because um, rightfully so, you know, they're, they're coping. Um, so another trend then, as I mentioned, was parent coaching programs. This is now for more toddler, preschool, kindergarten age children with autism. And similar to um, the prior project I just described, in research the goal is to have uh, this abbreviated um, weekly um, program help provide immediate information, help support parents during this time so that they have a set of interactive tools to help their children learn. It's not intended to replace intensive services. Again, it's not intended that we're now expecting parents to be their child's only therapist, but we are hoping that, they, that we can involve them, that we can help empower them and give them that confidence to, um, to bring, their back life, or bring their life back to um, kind of reasonable expectations, reasonable goals that they want to do with their family. And overall, there's, there's many different parent coaching programs out, out there, all supported by science. What they share, though, in, in common is this responsive, facilitative interaction style based, again, in empirically supported practices of how to uh, teach new behaviors and skills or how to change behavior should there be um, uh, problems, challenging problems uh, with children. And so they're... Uh, grounded in following the children's interests and preferences and activities. Again, really thinking about what's going on at home, what happens naturally at home, and how to insert teaching opportunities inside those existing, ongoing opportunities to learn. Talking about what the child's doing, naming what they're holding, naming what, they're, what actions they're doing with or without objects, imitating any um, actions or sounds or words that the child makes back to help them um, and start to understand their voice and the power behind their voice. And then expanding actions, this is that scaffolding support here, where you can offer that assistance, that support to help teach the child a slightly newer skill than what they're already doing, all so that we can promote active engagement and shared attention. And overall, from all these different parent coaching pro programs, the take-home message is that parents have are very successful natural teachers to their children. They're learning complicated intervention strategies that professionals are using in a short period of time. And, and kind of the mean progress or rate of change is that within six hours, that in some programs has been delivered just within two weeks. So they're seeing them multiply, you know, da daily within these two week um, time period, or across 12 weeks that six hours is divided. But in a short period of time, parents are producing a lot of positive, real, authentic change. Um, they're, they're reporting that they're feeling more empowered and confident again in their, um, in their not only in their interaction skills with their, with their children, but just in basic child rearing skills too. You know, how to deal with um, my child, should he have that tantrum in the grocery store? Or how to help expand my child's language so I can understand the needs better. And that, again, this relationship between parent skills and child outcome, or that there's a strong relationship between parent and children, because we learn from our interactions with people. I can't stress that enough. We, we learn from what um, we see people doing. We, um, we're, we're, very, you know, we're very social by nature, and so we have to have those relationships intact to help parents learn. But some um, caveats to this is that attendance alone in any program, any therapeutic approach is not enough to help children learn necessarily. That it's the quality of parental participation that makes the difference. And we have to take into account parents, kind of these outside factors, like parents' enthusiasm to participate. They may not be there yet. They may not have that buy-in to the approach and goals. And we don't want to railroad them into using it, but we want to understand then um, what, you know, what, where, where's, where's the hesitation coming from? Um, is it that it's not a, the practices don't fit um, in line with their existing beliefs? Um, there, maybe it's a cultural issue. We have to be really sensitive um, and aware of what's blocking um, parental participation and help uh, increase their confidence in delivering whichever approach 
best meets their needs, their children's needs, and their family's needs. And having them also really practice what we're providing to them. There's a lot of flexibility in how they practice it, where and when, but, the, but we can't take away, though, again, that point that it has to happen through social interaction so that we can see parent-child success on their goals. So kind of the last trend I'll talk about in research is how to strengthen um, parent-child learning. And this is where technology has a lot of potential to um, help parents increase the amount of learning that they're providing to their children to help that lear those learning opportunities occur more regularly and to enhance the value in the sense that it's more appealing to parents, um, that it doesn't feel like work or homework, but that it's a natural part of, or as most it can be, a natural part now of their, you know, their daily interactions so that we can promote, again, kind of real change in meaningful life moments, whether it's happening with toys, whether it's happening as we're just you know, hanging out in the family room, during family dinner time, helping mom with chores, or playing out in the backyard. And so with um, using the Early Start Denver model, again, one of just a evidence-based practice, though, for, uh, for, for young children with autism, uh, we've had, we have four ongoing studies, all involving technology. And the first study was connecting, this is, the study is completed where uh, we actually just submitted the paper to, to Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders, but um, it's, it, it was connecting with parents through a um, video conferencing program um, every week for 12 weeks, uh, and it was using a program similar to Skype, but that our university actually allows, which is um, the voice video chat program through Gmail, through Google. So there's this little pop-up window where, you, again, you and, and or the therapist and the family, uh, parent are communicating in real time. They're, seri they're seeing, hearing, talking to each other in real time. And um, in addition to the video conferencing so that we can see how parents want to use these techniques at home. So parents are at home, I should mention. For, I'm the therapist in this case. I'm at my desk at the Mind Institute. Parents are in their home, and they live all over. I had parents not only in California, but in, um, on the East Coast, in the Midwest, and a few families in Canada. So just after figuring out the time change difference, we were ready to go. And in addition to the video conferencing, they um, had all of our parent coaching um, topics um, on a DVD learning module that contained key session concepts and video examples and activity exercises for them to do at home. So we're really trying to uh, um, d implement or disseminate this information into homes to be relevant and useful for families to use. And from that study, what we saw was that, again, it took parents roughly seven to eight hours to start using the techniques consistently and successfully uh, and competently. And that was a similar amount of time um, to parents that were coming to our center for the same program. So distance was not a barrier in this case. Uh, and children responded with spontaneous language that was much higher than when they began the intervention. They um, had more um, interest and engagement and attentiveness to their parents. And so from this first study, now we're um, embracing technology, and we've developed this interactive ESDM website called esdmanywhere.org uh, that's, right now it's just through um, a study, so it's just available to families uh, that uh, enroll in the this, in this study. But it's embedding, again, video, concert, video conferencing features and these active, uh, self-guiding learning modules or learning activities to help parents, again, apply this information into real daily life activities to help their children learn and to track how parents are using the information and what's useful and what's not. And related to this then is a grant that uh, Sally Rogers just received, which is again looking at other technology open, uh, options to help really understand what parents um, how parents teach their children when we're not there watching. So the website that I just mentioned, you know, there's video conferencing, so again, parents and the therapist can see and, and talk to one another, and then the website can track what parents are doing based on what they enter into the website, but we still are kind of left to, you know, to guess um, what really happens in those moments parents aren't on the website. And so um, Sally's being very creative and innovative about um, a portable camera that parents can wear so that they could just slip it on really easily. They can kind of you know, walk around, hopefully not feel the camera, and we can record a lot more of what's going on at home. 
and using smart technology like you know an iPad that is um, so popular right now to help track children's goals um, uh, more immediately and faster so that if children are not responding to intervention, they are slowing down or they're plateauing, we can get in there and make changes right away to bring them back up to their um, an appropriate rate of progress. So I just want to end by saying that if a treatment exists but only half the people have access to it, then you've only discovered half the treatment. And um, for me as a researcher, as a sibling, as a, as, a, um, as a family member, that's not good enough. So that's been my personal um, motivation for being in this field, for working with families, for learning so much from them about what we can do to make their lives better. And I just want to thank you all for your attention. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference. I gotta tell you, I am really nervous. <laughs> I've never done this before, and certainly never done it in front of such a large and distinguished uh, audience. So if you'll just bear with me, in hopes of quieting my nerves, I've really gotta tell you how this really went down between Robin and I. About eight months ago, I'm walking by the Med Center, and Robin says, hey, I've got a great idea. We're, gonna, we're doing the Summer Institute, and I'd really like you to be involved. And, you know, being an immigrant child and being very insecure as a child, I have just an incredible need to please people. I mean, you know, somebody says walk on coals how long or jump off the uh, uh, Golden Gate Bridge how many times. So, Robin, great idea. W what, what do you want me to talk about? Oh, don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll really figure something out. And so I'd run into Robin and periodically I'd say, you know, the Institute's going to be in four months and three months. Have, have you decided what you want me to say? So Robin finally, a few months ago, says, Lou, I've got this great idea. This year, we really want to emphasize what is new and exciting and breakthrough in terms of aut autism research. And we really want to emphasize, you know, the young researchers and scientists. So I kind of look at her and I say, yeah. And she says, well, let, let me tell you a little story. Do you remember Clint Eastwood? Yeah, one of my favorite actors. When you think of Clint Eastwood, what is the movie that immediately comes to mind? Well, it's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, this year we thought that our keynote speak would be the young, the old, and the stale. <laughs> so uh, here I am, folks, and uh, I, I hope that I can, um, you know, and, and the other thing Robin says, you know, you've really been around ever since the Earth's crust began to cool. So that if you really emphasize how things were in the old days, then the rest of the uh, Mind Institute will really understand and the folks will really understand the tremendous advances we've made over the past eons. So, Robin, thank you so much for this pleasure and privilege, I think. Um, the goals and objectives that Lori and I will try. What could I do better? What haven't we tried? So it's also this sense of, um, of, of, uh, of anger, frustration, anxiety. The, the worst experience in the emotion that I uh, ex uh, felt uh, going through this very trying period was, um, was a sense of uncertainty. 
having worked in medicine essentially all of my adult life, uh, and particularly in cardiology where we have cutting edge tools, where we have ways of evaluating individuals, where there are ways of finding out what the problem is and addressing it, uh, dealing with a child with autism back in the 90s was a completely very foreign and daunting and overwhelming experience. Um, the, the other aspect that was very difficult for me to, to overcome was a tremendous sense of loss. Uh, for the first year, year and a half, we really thought that Mark was the prototypical ideal child. Uh, he met all of his developmental mi milestones during the first year. He was bright. He seemed you know, happy, active, interacted. And, and then uh, during his second year, we noticed that you know, his babbling ceased, his speech did not come in, and uh, uh, when he was about 16 to 17 months, uh, we were fortunate to have him, you know, to have him diagnosed and to start early intervention therapy, which did help, did make a significant difference, but certainly uh, left a lot of daunting challenges. Um, with a background in medicine and with having privileges to have access to a number of, of individuals in the community and, 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 and elsewhere, um, I dealt personally with a lot of my frustrations, anxieties, fear, guilts, and the emotions shown on the previous slide by really turning to what I knew best, and that was medicine and science. And so um, in the late, in the mid-1990s, um, a group of, a small group of families uh, met and uh, truly through a team effort and with a tremendous amount of community support and with and try to uh, share with you today our personal perspectives as well as some of the of the policy and systems changes that are related uh, changes faced by families California's public policy related autism uh, spectrum disorders and then Lori will really get you excited about advances in research uh, this basically is just a brief summary of, of my uh, of my life God, I, I, I mean, it, when, I, when I do this slide, I think about how many people were even born before I went to medical school, and we, we won't ask for a show of hands. Um, this is a slide of, uh, taken of a picture of our son, Mark, uh, who was born in 1993. This was taken when he was four and a half, five years of age. And um, what always reminds me about this slide is First of all, the number of interventions of a variety of, of, uh, from a variety of perspectives that our family faced during those, uh, those years. Um, and we, we really kind of were overwhelmed by the whole situation. And the challenging aspect, as you all know about autism, is the multiplicity of factors, the pervasiveness of this disorder, the variability, and for our family, it was certainly uh, the uncertainty. And the emotional challenges uh, were also pretty, uh, pretty overwhelming. I, one of the images that uh, really sticks in my mind was the severe behaviors that Mark experienced when, when he was like, one and a half to three years of age. And at that time, I was, I was very involved in my, in my private practice in, at Mercy General Hospital and had a large number of patients and people that I knew from the community. And often, I think, as, a, as parents, we really view our children and our families as a reflection of who and what we are and a sense of our own identity. And I can really remember walking uh, through Safeway grocery store here and Mark having a tantrum or having behaviors and really being embarrassed because I would see a neighbor or, or, or a patient and it was just always such a feeling, you know, you know, God, what am I, what am I doing wrong? What, what have I done? There's, and uh, ultimately would result in economic savings to the state. And again, with incredible gratitude for ongoing community support 
and through the leadership of, uh, again, uh, Dr. Hansen and an incredible number of, of individuals uh, in the health sciences system and in the medical school, I believe that our, our hope, many of our hopes and prayers and, and, and views for the Mind Institute uh, have come, are coming, and must come in the future to pass. And again, your participation, your involvement, your, your engagement is, will, is and will really be crucial to our effort. This, is, this truly has to be an ongoing team approach. And again, the fact that you're here this morning and participating is something for which I don't have the words to adequately express my admiration and my appreciation for your involvement. So thank you all very, very much for being here. Um, the mission of the Mind Institute is again noted and all of these slides are in your package so I do not want to, to belabor them. Uh, the current status of the Mind Institute is again summarized briefly in this slide. Um, the research and the science and the knowledge base that is currently going on at the mind is truly, truly awesome, and I hope that you will uh, share that appreciation after the end of, uh, of, of, of this important summit. Um, I'm very excited and privileged to be the incoming chair of the Mind Advisory Board. Uh, I have worked with key members of our board, and during my tenure, we have outlined three specific goals and objectives. Number one is to take the science and the research and scientific advances that are at the mind and find innovative approaches of bringing them out into the community and finding greater ways and finding improved and innovative ways to provide greater uh, access and, and finding ways to, uh, to find bridges into the community. There's no doubt that the mind is focused on science and research, but with the innovations that are an incredible commitment from the, uh, uh, the folks at the UC Davis Health Center System and the, and, and the medical school, and Robin, Dr. Hansen was, was right there at the beginning along with uh, a number of other individuals, we were able to um, to initiate the starting of, of, of the Mind Institute. And since advocacy is such an important aspect of, of this year's Mind Institute, throughout my presentation, I will try to share with you some of the mistakes that we've made, but also some of the strategies and some of the approaches that seem to have been effective or worked in this situation with the hope that, that people here in the audience and attending the Institute will, will take them to a whole complete level although a lot's been accomplished in the past decade, again, through a tremendous commitment and involvement for an incredible array of, of individuals, there is a tremendous amount that needs to be done. And with the economic challenges that our state and our nation and individuals are facing, uh, this is a, an incredibly important task, which requires a commitment and the involvement of everyone in this room and even those beyond. One of the important aspects that led to the success of the Mind Institute was really the idea of a public-private partnership. Again, uh, there was a small group of families, but there were a lot of people involved in this effort. And again, through incredibly generous donations, we were able to raise a, a significant amount of, of money uh, during the first few months that this vision was entertained. This money was actually leveraged uh, through um, uh, additional private donations from commitments from the University of California and the UCD Health Center System, Health Sciences System, and also from uh, legislative appropriations. And, and the way we were successful with the legislature was, first of all, having personal relationships with key legislative advocates from both parties. Governor Wilson was, uh, was in, in, in office at the time and was very, very supportive. Um, and again, Shown to the right of the slide were some of the uh, uh, approaches that we used, including uh, clearly defining that the autism epidemic was a serious public health issue, that the Mind Institute would be unique, and, and our vision was for a, a truly world-class institution, that it would provide answers.